This lecture will deal with police issues and different trends that are occurring in policing. Key to police success. One of the most important elements that contributes to su successful police work is the people that you hire. The selection and training of these people is important because it can overcome many obstacles. This table basically talks about reasons for choosing police as a career. Some of the reasons listed include variety of work, responsibility, the ability to serve the public, adventure, security, pay, benefits, advancement, retirement, and prestige. The next table shows the changing profile of American police officers. Uh, of the over 300,000 officers, the majority are, are still male. There's only a little less than 50,000 that are female. There are over 250,000 that are white, about 40,000 that are African American, 30,000 Hispanic, and about 10,000 that are other uh, minority subcultures. Recruitment currently is changing. A lot of departments are going to colleges in California in particular. It's required to have uh, an, at least a, no, a number of college units at most departments. There are some that still only require a high school diploma, but locally in the East Bay, the Richmond Police Department requires uh, 45 units and the Berkeley Police Department requires 60 units of college um, units. Uh, and the thought is that you're going to find a more diverse group or pool of employees. What would be reasons for looking uh, at educating the police or for off officers that have um, some sort of college education? And uh, it's believed that there's numerous advantages that with the education um, comes uh, innate responsibility and inculcates responsibility. In other words, people are more responsible. Uh, they're able to communicate better in writing and, and verbally. It helps them cope with stress and they're able to handle difficult, difficult situations better. On the other side, there's empirical research uh, that doesn't prove the advantages exist. It said that educated police are not superior to as seen from the point of view of the client uh, and that fewer, there are fewer citizen complaints but more internal complaints. Training. A lot of the training is moving to college to run programs and academies and regional training centers. But in the last two years, we're seeing because the colleges don't have money to run police academies. Police academies are extremely expensive. Uh, colleges make their money when there are uh, the ratio of instructor to student is about 1 to 32. That is where they really like to make their money. The problem is, is in a shooting course, the ratio is 5 to 1 because you have to be responsible and able to physically touch your student to ensure that they're, they're safe. And in driving, it's obviously 1 to 1. And um, so colleges are not very happy with those ratios. So we're seeing sheriff's departments take back academies. Again, there's little... <coughs> Clear-cut evidence that college education, educated cops exhibit better performance than those who lack degrees. Uh, but, uh, you know, the biggest difference, I think, is going to be communication on paper. Because if you've taken an English 1A course and you've learned to write and you've learned to uh, organize a paper grammatically and spelling-wise, etc., that is going to really help you. Uh, if you got those skills, if you picked up those skills and you were academically prepared after you got a high school, then, you know, the chances are you're still going to be able to do a good job. Civil rights movement in the 60s actually opened up the ability for more women and minorities to work in police work. There's a case, 1988, where the city of Buffalo, New York, was sued uh, by officers who claimed they discriminated against minorities. And judges ruled that discriminatory practices have to be job related and that hiring should reflect the percentage of qualified minorities in the available workforce. The affirmative action programs that came about in the 70s and 80s were found to be um, discriminatory against other folks. And so a lot of that has been struck down. Um, 
the belief though is that if you have a percentage the the, the belief in affirmative action was let's say that you have a city and it's 25 percent spanish-speaking latino well then your department should reflect that and that's kind of what they're saying if there's the available pool is out there that it should reflect what the community looks like And here's Equal Opportunity Act of 1972, which states that it should be unlawful employment practice for an employer to fail or refuse to hire or to discharge any individual other or otherwise to discriminate against any individual with respect to, respect to his compensation, terms, conditions, or privileges of employment because of such individuals' race, color, religion, sex, or national origin. Race and gender and policing. So some of the questions posed by the officers, do minority uh, officers face any different pressures than do uh, majority members of police officers? Um, it, it It's hard if you are the first new minority in your police department uh, because officers aren't sure, that, you know, basically it's a subculture and we're going to talk about the fact that when you go into the police academy, they strip away a lot of your individual uh, characteristics and you become part of a team. And so that does happen that way. But there is, behind closed doors, you're still going to be uh, the strange new kid on the block that they have to deal with. Uh, is it, here's another good question. Is a female a policewoman, a police, or police, I don't understand this the way he wrote it. Is it, is the, oh, I get it. Is a female a policewoman, or policewoman, or policewoman? In other words, and what's happening now is we're getting away from that term police woman, police man, what we're using now is police officer because it represents both. And the next question he asks is a black man, a black policeman or a black policeman or a black policeman? Just changing the emphasis on the word. And uh, so the thinking here is in both of those uh, situations, what they're trying to say is, are you black first then the policeman? Or are you black but you were a policeman first? or it does it not matter and uh, I will tell you that on the street we're all blue and that's what it comes down to the, the police work is the only uh, job where the person you're working with, with you may not care for them you may actually hate them but if they call you for assistance you're going to be right there and that's what makes it such a different profession and how you have to kind of separate your personal from your um, professional uh, work life Women in police work. 60% of all sworn officers are women. Role of women in police has been restricted by social barriers, including gender conflict, jealousy, and stereotyping. Administrative barriers include underrepresentation at senior administrative levels, like captain, lieutenant, and selective utilization of their skills and training. When I, when I first went to Berkeley PD, they had police women, PW1 and PW2, and they were just assigned to juvenile bureau. Then they had a new description that came up, which was called police officer, and those female officers worked right alongside us. So we could actually see the historical transition of where women were not allowed in uniform, they weren't really working the street. As a matter of fact, there was complaints from the police women that the uniforms that they were issued were different than the men. I mean, it was a little bit different. They didn't appreciate that. They wanted to have the same thing. And so Berkeley changed, and they honored that request. Research results about women in policing. They're less likely to use a firearm in a violent confrontation than male officers. Uh, are more emotionally stable than male officers, probably less um, of the uh, testosterone run in there. And they're less likely to seriously injure a uh, citizen than a male officer. And are no more, no more likely to suffer injuries than their male partners. What I found is women go through different phases if the department is very macho and you have one or two females that are working there, then what's going to happen is they're going to move toward the image of the macho officer. And uh, you've, you might have heard the, the, the term Jane Wayne. And having worked in a department where females were just starting to work the street, I kind of I kind of saw two different things happen. The first ones that were there were trying to be macho. As we got more females, the other females, the peer group, developed and the peer group, peer group said hey man we're women we're not these guys we don't have to act like these guys let's do our own thing and I started to see a change 
And as that happened, I started to see female officers keep up with the male officers on statistics, but have far less complaints against them. Uh, so they kind of use their brains a lot more than their brawn in, in reaching the same goal, which I thought was really intelligent and interesting. The subculture of policing. Well, let's talk about subculture. First of all, subculture is a subdivision of natural national culture, U.S. and American culture, defined by your occupation, ethnicity, class, and residence. Now, in this case, we're talking about occupation, right? Because there's a lot of different ethnic groups within policing, but the occupation, they all have the same job. So the subculture forms, <coughs> the C forms functioning group unity by shared values, beliefs, and attitudes. And so starting from the training process, the trainings leads police to have shared expectations about human behavior. You develop what's called a working personality. So you go to the academy, and we start to shape your personality. And we start to have you look at things a little bit differently, uh, including two important elements of the working personality is danger and authority. Um, Police recruits, I can remember teaching in the academy in Santa Rosa, and police recruits, as I would walk by, would immediately stand at attention and would represent my, my rank as sergeant before I retired and would wait for me to salute them or say, as you were, or they would not move. <laughs> that was number one. Number two, if any instructor caught a recruit with anything in their gun hand, like a book or you know papers or what have you, they were immediately had to give you 50 push-ups. And what they were doing was conditioning that recruit not to keep their gun hand occupied so that in, in some sort of a tense situation, they were prepared to defend themselves. In general, no matter whether you were extremely successful with testing in the academy or not, they took everybody and they reduced them down to zero as far as your, um, your self-esteem, everything. And then they build you back up the way that they want to. So where do they, what is danger? Danger is where you're looking for signs of potential violence in the, works, in the work environment. And so we socialize recruits to be cautious and suspicious. And we also teach them that when they see something that, that makes their little alarm go off in their head or their little personal radar that they think something is, is funky going on, that maybe a crime's going to be committed, that they go up and watch and question people. And this can contribute to tension and conflict in, con in contacts with the public because in general, people walking down the street do not want to be questioned. Um, so one of the things we do is teach you to be kind of on edge. You're always watching to see what's going on. Um, eventually, it can move into your private life too, which is not very cool. Uh, there is a an art. There's a book that was out called Clashes of Culture, and it talks about this one academy instructor who the students uh, jokingly name him the Blade because one of the things that we teach a position of interrogation where you blade your body to the to the person you're talking to to keep your gun sight away. And this guy could not turn off his personal radar and he would be at private parties or, um, you know, meeting girls at the bar and he would blade them and they'd look at him like, what the heck are you doing? And he didn't realize that he was actually doing that himself. Authority. Police officers... Uh, you know, are a symbol of authority, but they still have a low occupational status. Now, this is changing slowly because their pay is coming up. They're often uh, assertive in establishing authority with citizen citizenship with citizens, and um, this can lead to conflict and hostility, and perhaps even overreaction or police brutality, um, because someone may not like being told to do something, and then the officer has to end up um, arresting them. Or, uh, and a lot of times, what happens? Officers who don't have good self-control, after a while, they uh, have less self-control, and when somebody kind of talks back to them, they look for some way to arrest this person instead of just letting it roll off their back and saying, hey, you know, it's part of the job. Just move along. Let me go to my next case. Officers are also expected to remain detached, neutral, and unemotional when challenged and in situations of conflict and also when they see something violent. And, you know, after a while that gets to you because you, um, you need to have some sort of mechanism to try to release that stress. And we'll talk about stress in a minute. Police isolation. Police generally, uh, 
public is generally supportive of the police, but the police perceive the public as being hostile. So officers tend to hang out with each other, their families hang out together. Um, because if you go to a, a private party, I can't tell you how many times I've gone to a private party and someone found out I'm a cop and they want to come up to me and they want to talk to me about every ticket that they have. They got a drunk driving, the officer was a jerk, officer was totally wrong. What's my opinion? Well, I don't really want to give an opinion on that. It's really hard to deal with somebody because one of the things I, that if I'm pushed in a corner, I'll say, you know, I don't want to insult you, but um, initially I, I'm going to believe what the officer said unless I had some other evidence. So, I mean, that's the way it's going to go. So this increases the needs for social, socialization between officers and it develops a group identity. Um, and you're able to talk about a lot of things on the job, but you kind of understand each other. So the police subculture characteristics include clannishness, which means, you know, when you're a clan, you hang together. And so you'll find officers do stuff off duty. They go on vacations together, a variety of things. Secrecy, not really talking. You, you're not supposed to release private information to the public anyhow. But in, in some ways, they don't talk about their job. They keep things to themselves. Isolations from others, you know, not... If you're on a situation, a case, and, and something happens, there could be a lot of pressure on you to turn in an officer, and certainly if they do something wrong, you should go to a supervisor to discuss it, because there are situations where an officer does something wrong, you don't do anything about it, they get arrested on a federal violation, and you get arrested along with them for conspiring. So it's important that if you see something wrong, you need to report it. But in, the mo in, in many cases, there's a lot of pressure on officers to be quiet, and this is called the blue curtain of silence, or the blue wall of silence. Police subculture core beliefs. And, and these are the things that cops believe after time, and, and it basically goes along with, if you're going to be in this, in this clan, you need to follow some of these rules. Police are the only real crime fighters. Only the police understand police. Loyalty to one another is paramount. The war on crime can only be won by bending a few rules. The public doesn't support the police. Patrol work is the pits. Detective work is glamorous. Cynicism in policing. Now, cynicism is an attitude of scornfulness or bitterness. Basically, bad attitude. Just thinking the worst about every situation. And the author claims that it increases with years of service. And also, if you have college graduates who are not getting promoted, it increases. Because typically what will happen in some departments is, if you have a department that just has new minorities, and, and the department heads see the necessity of promoting the minorities, others that are there resent that. And it starts to, to, to deal with morale goes down, and you have some problems. Also, military-type training academies cause self-cynicism. So job stress, how do we deal with it? Working environment and subculture affect the physical and mental health in the form of marital problems, health problems, and a lot of cops have drinking problems. External st stress comes from the real threats and dangers on the job. Internal or organizational stress are produced by paramilitary, um, the paramilitary character of police forces, meaning that you take orders ultimately. So if there's a situation you want to deal with, but your sergeant comes up and says, no, I'm ordering you to do it this way, it may be against your ethical standard to do that. You don't want to do that, but you're ordered to, so you do it, it causes stress. The odd hours of having to work, shifts, changing schedules, and having to follow you know, a number of rules and procedures, that's all stressful and you have to learn to deal with it. Personal stress can be affected by racial or gender status and not adjusting to the group held values. If you're the first black female who's hired at a department, you're going to be dealing with a lot of different issues. They're not going to be used to you. You're not going to be used to them. And you're going to have to control those people who um, may not be culturally diverse. You're going to have to train them. You're going to have to put them on notice and you're going to have to uh, you know, make statements that might be stressful to make, but to, to clear the air so that you can do your job. This chart basically just shows the, the different sorts of stress in police work, the operational stress and seeing human strategy, uh, tragedy, 
and the real threats, threats or dangers. This is another one that basically shows you the different things that can, can uh, affect you. Inherit resources, system sources, you know, the, the actual administrative pressure on you at the police department, personal sources, external sources, and coping mechanisms. So what have police departments done to try to cope with stress? Well, most of them have provided counseling for officers free of charge, and it's private and confidential. And uh, there have been a number of officers that go and, and seek counseling. You know, if you get in a police shooting, you don't just put the person right back out on the street. An example would be there was a small police agency that was under trained. The officer was stabbed as a result of bad training and bad tactics. And uh, he was put back on the street right after he healed up and um, was not given any counseling. And the first case he goes on, he thinks the guy has a knife, which he doesn't, and he shoots the guy. And so in that sort of a situation, he's overreacting because he hasn't gotten any counseling and he hasn't dealt with some of these demons. Uh, so police departments have been kind of slow to deal with stress, but many are developing counseling. And there's liberal disability rules and other mechanisms. In other words, if you have an officer that gets in a shooting and he kills somebody and he can't live with that, taking someone else's life, then it causes the psychological trauma that could occur where they'll overreact or underreact. You can't have that in police work. They could be offered a psychological retirement in that case and get out of police work with some sort of a retirement if they've been there at least five years. The next thing we're going to start looking at is police corruption. And there's different, you know, I did some research in corruption and you see the complaints that come in on officers are different. East Coast has more of active involvement in theft and extortion and some things like that, where the West Coast is more um, abuse of force cases are the things that we see. Julian Robeck at Mississippi State University in the early 90s did uh, uh, a typology, meaning setting up different types or descriptions of police corruption. I'm going to go over some of them, and then we'll look at the ones that the author has identified. Some are the same. So these are the types of corruption that she speaks about in her study. And the first is corruption of authority. And this is where um, you get a free cup of coffee in a place or you get uh, some free food in exchange for not writing uh, parking tickets in the front of the, the restaurant where the, the patrons are. Kickbacks, you see that more in the East Coast. It has to do more with if you're using a towing service to... Um, tow cars on a regular basis. They give you a little percentage kickback, maybe play, pay for your vacation every year. Opportunist theft is going into a business that's already been burglarized and taking additional property. Shakedowns are where you stop criminals and you take their money or dope away from them. Protection of illegal activities is where you look the other way for money allow prostitutes to work or dope dealers to deal or or underground speakeasy nightclubs to flourish. The fix is where after somebody has been uh, arrested, usually the detective takes money so that the, uh, the case disappears. Direct criminal activities, there have been some cases in Southern California where there was actually a little bit of change in the dynamics of the corruption. A whole precinct was closed because they were involved in doing burglaries and covering each other and internal payoffs where someone might want to be promoted or um, back in the East Coast one of the things that they found was in some departments where the officers were collecting money and paying their supervisor and they're going right up the line. Now according to the author they have a variety of different things like mooching, chiseling, favoritism, all of those things have to do with you know, corruption of authority. Somebody gives you something, you get, you give them something. Chiseling or mooching is like where you're, you're trying to get something for free. Um, obviously showing prejudice, shopping, you know, being able to shop on duty and getting everything for free. And then extortion, very much like shakedown, you give me your money and I won't, I won't uh, turn you in. Um, bribery, perjury, you know, lying on cases, a premeditated theft. And you can read about these in the in the book. The Knapp Commission was a commission that investigated police corruption in the 70s after an officer named uh, Serpico 
came forward and Frank Serpico reported internal payoffs in his department. And uh, as a result, they identified two different types of um, corrupt officers, the meat eaters, who are those that were aggressively out there trying to demand uh, bribes and threaten legal action or cooperating with criminals to make money. And the grass eaters, who were, who were not really out there looking for anything, but they were there and they would accept bribes from persons, um, although they weren't actively looking for it. The author's definition of police brutality includes abusive language, unnecessary use of force or coercion, threats or harassment. And the statement that he uses is those most likely to have force used against them are those who show disrespect for police once they've been arrested. Corrupt police departments is a variety of different theories. Uh, one group is called the Rotten Apples or Rotten Pockets, and these are departments that have few corrupt officers who use their position for personal gain, meaning that there's you know, like just one bad guy, don't blame us all. Uh, pervasive unorganized corruption is a majority of, of the police are corrupt, but they have little relationship with each other. And then pervasive organized corruption is where they're actually a systematic and organized uh, um, group that are out there collecting money, protection money, or what have you. Uh, if you want to look at a, a movie that talks about some of these things, you might look at Prince in the City. Um, you also may look at The Big Easy with Dennis Quaid talking about New Orleans and the, um, the police department actually had what they call the Widow and Orphans Fund. They, they'd go out on the street and the bars would pay them a certain amount of money to do the job they're already doing, but they would split that amongst everybody. So the author asks some questions. Is corruption caused by the type of person who becomes a cop? The discretion police have and low visibility of their job? Or police administrators who don't do anything to corrupt officers? Or society's ambivalence toward the many forms of vice-related activities that are related to police corruption, like gambling? They really don't care. They'd rather not see police... Uh, invoke those those laws so what's social ambivalence it's where the there are laws that are out there that lead toward police corruption like prostitution or drinking after hours and these are laws that maybe the police in some cases they do they do enforce these laws but in other cases they're victimless crimes and um, they don't want to be bothered or they know that the majority of that neighborhood's involved and that um, that uh, they don't want to be involved with, with closing something like that down, like maybe a gambling parlor. And they would rather collect a little money for it. But the bottom line is, is that it exists because the climate that tolerates it uh, allows officers to be corrupt and, and take money for it. How do you change police corruption? Well, the first thing is that there needs to be a change in department tolerances. And there needs to be more of a willingness to take cases to court. And there has to be more scrutiny by the government, some outside oversight model. Or great a greater access to police practices for the public. And also changing what the public will accept from the police. Now, an honest police officer who's trying to do their job has what's called uh, immunity and if they were doing something that was they they made a reasonable choice and uh, then they're immune from from civil litigation in that situation the author asks here it says that to the how to what extent should officers be immune for legal responsibility for their behavior and how do you make those distinctions well one of the things is we have what's called the 1983 lawsuits and I'll read this to you. Every person who, under color of any statute, ordinance, regulation, custom, or usage of any state or territory subjects or causes, causes to be subjected, any citizen of the United States or other person within the jurisdiction thereof to the deprivation of any rights, privileges, or immunities secured by the Constitution and the laws shall be liable to the party injured in an action at law, suit in equity, <clears throat> or other proper proceeding for redress. Meaning that you can sue if your rights are violated. Let's talk about torts and lawsuits against the police. Uh, 
First of all, the respondent superior rule is a legal rule that imposes liabilities on governments and others for torts committed by their employees, meaning that if you're going to sue the police, you're not going to sue the individual officer, although some people do do that. You're going to sue the city that they work for, the county or state they work for, because they're the ones that have money. Torts are part of the civil law. They, they can be actions committed by the police that violated duties imposed on all, all um, people. So a tort is supposed to get you back to where you were before the police action and also to pay some punitive damages. Officers are immune from punitive damages if what they did was reasonable. But let's say the, the police department practice was fa the policy of the department was a, a failure, um, then that's officer get sued. Examples. Officers go to a wrong house to serve a search warrant and they break the shoulder of um, a gentleman inside the house because they run over him to get into a back room and it's a tight hallway. This is an actual case. And the gentleman weighs about 350 pounds and he's blocking the hallway. So they knock him down. They run over him to go to the back and complete the search warrant. And they separate his shoulder. They find out they have the wrong place. Those officers are liable. And in that case, they did pay. They paid something like $64,000. Who investigates misconduct? Well, there are a number of different entities that investigate it. Most are internal affair units at police departments. Most police departments have some means of investigating alleged misconduct by its officers. This sometimes is a special unit department or an, or an individual that's charged with this responsibility. They go and invest. Typically what happens is they take a complaint. They bring in the officer and they record a statement from the officer. They record a statement from the victim. The officer comes in and reviews the, the case and signs the, the um, in bottom of the investigation as well as the victim. They come up with some sort of <coughs> disposition which could be unfounded that the officer was off duty that day. They weren't, weren't even around. Exonerated, meaning that yes, they broke the guy's arm, but the guy had it coming. They had to do it not sustained, meaning that there's not clear and convincing evidence that the officer did it, although they were there. In other words, it's a wash. It's the, the word of the victim against the word of the officer, and there's no compelling evidence in either direction. And sustained, which means that, yes, the officer did it, they were wrong, and they should be, uh, they should be uh, disciplined. That case then goes to the chief of police, who will usually make a decision about discipline in the case. The following uh, is an example of how officers make um, complaints, and it compares complaints of citizens when they're going to go through the, the criminal process with, uh, and with that of off when an officer assaults them or does something. So if you look at this up at the top on most internal affairs units investigations really concern sexual harassment, substance abuse, misuse of physical force, and, and the big one is breaking departmental rules, abuse of sick time, not completing reports properly, uh, insubordination. Those are the things that, that internal affairs deals with. Most police corruption is enhanced by the officer's discretion and low visibility, unless, in other words, no one ever finds out. Check the discussion forum section for this week, and you're going to have to do a current event. I know that I will assign a current event looking for police misconduct, so start looking for it now so that you can submit it in a timely fashion. 1978, Janet Fishman did a study, and <clears throat> one of the things dealing with police corruption was that officers can only get away with what the peer group approves. Um, and it depends what, on the approval of deviant activities that's involved. And there was two classifications they had. They had dirty money and clean money. Clean money came from speakeasies and uh, from gambling. Dirty money was drug money, robberies, you know, violent crime monies that came out. And in general, the officers that were corrupt in this study would accept uh, clean money but would not accept dirty money. They also talked, they did a, um, a chart, which I don't have in here, for this lecture, but it talked about peer group approval, and it compared about 10 of the, the big major police departments, and from things from getting a free cup of coffee, getting free tickets to the movie on your beat, getting a free Christmas tree on a um, Christmas tree lot, getting free dinners, getting uh, vacations paid for by companies on your beat, and it showed where officers approve that was approval ratings in certain departments and low approval ratings in other departments. 
the rotten apple theory again I talked about this earlier but it's if a cop is caught dirty it's denounced as being a rotten barrel apple in an otherwise clean barrel and it, for the most part you know there are a lot of officers that resent the corruption of their fellow officers but it's hard to say anything about it because of the blue wall of silence nobody wants to be labeled as a rat so it's a pretty tough wall to break through how do we determine whether or not we have problem officers well one is to look at the number of officers who have you know more than three complaints per year and to determine what those complaints are and to counsel those officers and find out if they're if you want them to stay at your department so this right here is a a survey that was done in 91 it was in Washington State uh, Police Departments and it talks about you know you get one complaint 282 officers had one complaint per year 98 officers had two and 35 had three now obviously if you look at this chart you want to start looking at these officers that have uh, you know uh, more than three complaints and then compare it with where they're working if they're working in traffic bureau they're probably going to get a number of complaints if they're just for things like discourtesy or um, I don't like the way you talk to me that sort of thing on uh, traffic complaints there's you know you need to talk to your officer and what happens is they need to be retrained to say very little on those traffic stops do their job write the ticket yes ma'am no ma'am and get on with with their work now this next chart talks about um, the this is in 91 and so it's, it's about 10 years old but it talks about the different types of complaints and those that are sustained and those are that are um, uh, and it lays out the percentages and I thought when I looked at this a deadly force would be one of the biggest areas but it's not it's really if you look at it it's verbal conduct officers don't know when to shut their mouth and let the citizen have the last word 41 percent of complaints were for verbal conduct and that's something that we can train to and that's something that we can deal with occupational deviants <clears throat> we're going to start looking at some other sorts of uh, definitions of different types of misconduct occupational deviance is any forbidden act that involves a misuse of the officer's official position for actual or expected material reward or gain in other words they're out there trying to get some money misconduct though is the same thing but there's no material reward expected in other words the officer may um, they're involved in misuse of their official position like they're using their patrol car when they shouldn't to give friends rides or uh, they're meeting their girlfriend in their patrol car and uh, having sex or they're drinking abuse of authority is any action on the part of the officer in the course of their duties it tends to cause physical or psychological harm or violate rights of the community this is a typology of police deviance by Baker and if you look at this you start on on the left you have occupational deviance the far left is corruption including criminal acts bribery theft extortion to the right of that section is misconduct sleeping on duty drinking on duty sex on duty alcohol or drug use on duty on the right is abuse of authority starting with legal abuse which would include uh, perjury physical abuse which is brutality and psychological abuse including profanity or abusive language So what do Americans think? The question asks is, would you approve of a policeman striking a citizen who, and the first graph is, was attacking a policeman with his fists? 90% said they would approve, 8% said no. Would you approve of a policeman striking a citizen who was attempting to escape from custody? 68% said yes, 27% said no. Uh, or use force on a person who's vulgar or saying obscene things 7% said yes 92% said no and the last one using force on someone who's being questioned in a murder case 6% said yes and 93% said no so it's obvious that Americans believe officers should be able to defend themselves but when it's verbal conduct they're dealing with that they shouldn't get physical the next topic is deadly force that's a real hot topic and data suggests about 250 people are killed by the police every year 
unreported data indicates this number may actually approach 1,000 per year. A disproportional number of police shootings involve minorities. However, if such factors as armed suspects, violent crime, and attacks on officers are considered, racial differences are not insignificant, meaning that if the person is attacking an officer, it really doesn't matter what color their skin is, officers have the right to defend themselves. And so what's reasonable? Well, officers have to use force commiserate with what the resistance is. In other words, if someone is... Uh, is um, trying to box with you, you know, using pepper spray or baton is appropriate. If they pick up a baseball bat, we've moved up to a situation where we're going to use deadly force to protect ourselves. If they drop the baseball bat, we're back down to verbal commands, getting them to do what we want them to do. This next um, chart shows a report of uh, use of force in big cities and different techniques that could be used obviously the one that's used the most and these are in order of the most used to the least used handcuff and leg restraints then body force you know arm leg pushing or kicking come alongs control holds unholstering your weapon and brandishing it would be next swarm a swarm is where officers will rat pack somebody twist locks or wrist locks then firm grip, just grabbing somebody and leading them out. Next would be chemical agents, then batons, then flashlights, then dog attacks or bites, then tasers, then civilians shot at but not hit, other impact weapons, neck restraints like chokeholds, karate restraints, vehicle rammings, civilians shot and killed, and civilians shot and wounded but not killed. And this comes from 1996, the U.S. Department of uh, Bureau of Statistics. Ways of controlling shooting? Well, training first. Uh, narrow discretion, you know, when you could use a gun, when you can't. Violence reduction and training. Uh, better means of getting assistance, having cover there. Better protective equipment. Less lethal weapons like, you know, the impact rounds that are putty rounds or tasers. Pepper spray. Strong personnel policies. Counseling for stress cultural awareness, and developing rewards for not shooting. These are, again, the author's uh, opinions. Related factors to police shootings. You know, police shootings occur because a variety of things can be happening. Could be the characteristics of the police jurisdiction, the exposure to violence, it's a more violent community, the workload of officers. Officers are overworked and they don't have enough out there to protect them. Because if you show up at a sh with, with two guys that have guns and 10 officers show up with shotguns and, and long guns and handguns, they're going to give up. If one shows up, they might take him on. The availability of firearms, the gun density in the area, or can you go out on the street and buy a gun? <clears throat> the social variables of the individuals in the area, if, they, if they're if they a really violent group, you know, you have some in the city of Richmond, you have some extremely violent uh, groups that are out there shooting at each other all the time. Uh, administrative policies, you know, being more lax and allowing officers to shoot or or um, or having a more open policy. And the, the race of officers and suspects. Although I already told you that if you're if if most of the the violent crime is being committed by the Crips or Bloods in South Central Los Angeles, then you know what the race of the offender is going to be in most situations. If it's in East Los Angeles, the race of the offender is going to change to Latino. So it just depends on what area of town you're going to be working in some of those instances. Are there statistics that say that? If you're a minority, you have a higher chance of being shot by the police. The answer is yes. And do we need to deal with this in, in training to make police not re overreact when they have a person of color? The answer, again, is yes. There are some cases that have come out of the Supreme Court that have controlled use of force by police officers. One is Tennessee versus Garner. And Tennessee versus Garner, they used to be able to shoot at any fleeing felon, whether they were armed or not. And in the case uh, in Tennessee, uh, a young man w did a burglary and was running from the police. He happened to be a, a young black, 12, I can't, either 12 or 14 year old. And the officer chasing him was also black. He was an African American and shot the kid in the back and killed him. And under that case, that was a, a, approved by departmental policy. But the Supreme Court in Tennessee versus Gardner said that it put an ad to any local police policy that allowed officers to shoot unarmed or non dangerous offenders if they resisted or attempted to flee. Now, the change is this. 
if the person is believed to be armed and uh, is a danger to the community and they're fleeing, you can still shoot them in the back. In other words, I have a guy that I've been in a shootout with and he is running toward a daycare center and he's running with a gun in his hand. And I can only imagine if he gets to the daycare center, what he's going to do to those kids when he gets there. He's going to hold them hostage. You can take them out. In Graham versus Connor, it says that force is excessive when considering all the circumstances known to the officer at the time or he, she acted, and the force used was unreasonable. In other words, you have to use the right amount of force for the situation, and officers have to make that decision. The court's going to make the decision based on the info the officer had at the time. In other words, you see a guy and you shoot him, and then you find out he's a mass murderer, but at the time you pulled the trigger, he wasn't a danger to you. You're going to be liable. Civic accountability. More and more cities are starting to look at how to um, look at police complaints, citizen complaints to the police because they're paying so much for police um, services. And it's becoming more of a customer-based um, area now. History of Civilian Review. As far back as 1931, uh, President Hoover put together a group that wanted to identify the political control of the police and help institute civil service system because they felt there was a lot of corruption going on. As far back as 1966, Mayor Lindsay in New York passed the Civilian Complaint Review Board. Uh, he put it on the ballot, uh, and it, it uh, lost because the police associations campa campaigned against it. They said that it would hamper the police in suppressing crime, and they used the minority civil unrest as, that was part of the civil rights movement as a scare tactic with conservative white groups, and it lost at the ballot. 1971, uh, the Knapp Commission, after hearing the testimony of Frank Serpico, um, was put together to investigate police misconduct. In 1975, the Detroit Police Commission uh, was started because in 1972, Dr. Hu Hu Herbert Odom, who was a black dentist, was driving along and, and he had a taillight out and the police pulled him over and they wanted to search his car and he refused and they beat him. It turned out he's the best friend of uh, U.S. Representative Ralph Metcalf, who took interest in the case and got the officers reprimanded and led to the Office of Professional Standards, which is civilian staff now. That group... Detroit Police Commission now hires and fires the chief of police, so this is what we would call a watershed incident in policing. It really changed what went on. In the 70s, they had the uh, riots at People's Park in Berkeley, and as a result of that, the people of Berkeley felt that the officers were way too brutal, and they voted uh, for an initiative that would investigate police misconduct. In San Francisco Bay Area, there are a number of police oversight models, including cities of Berkeley, Oakland, Nevada, Richmond, San Francisco, San Jose, and Santa Cruz. Uh, in Berkeley, let's talk about the different models. Berkeley, Richmond, San Francisco are very similar. Officers go in and talk to an independent investigator who gathers evidence. They also talk to the victim in the case, and then they come out with a report, and it's voted on by a police commission. The police commission in Berkeley and Richmond are, are, and San Francisco are appointed by the mayor or city council. And in Richmond, it, I have worked as a police commissioner in Richmond, and you sit for a three-year term, you're appointed by the mayor. They review, you review the transcription of the interviews by both the officers and the citizens, and as a result of that, you make a decision on your case as to whether or not you're going to sustain the complaint or not, based upon a level of evidence called clear and convincing. That's like about 80% sure that the person, that the officer did it or not. Uh, at that point, you uh, vote to discipline the officer or not. You suggest the discipline and you give that to the police chief. If the police chief agrees, then they, they will go ahead and discipline the officer. If they don't agree, then they'll have their own report done and they'll go to the city manager or they'll say, no, I don't agree with you. At that point, you can appeal it to the city manager who has to make a decision on the case. Now, I've seen it done a whole bunch of different ways. Uh, the city of Richmond went through three different police chiefs while I was there. And uh, in some instances, 
the city manager was very favorable of the police commission and always voted on their on the issues of complaints in their favor in other situations they voted always with the chief of police i've seen the chief of police uh, just take the um police commission uh, results and say this is good enough for me I'm going to terminate or I'm going to suspend the officer so I've seen every different scenario play out in every different way in those sorts of situations now um, in the city of Nevada and San Jose it's done a little differently in Nevada you make a complaint you go through the internal affairs process if you're not happy with the disposition of the case from the chief of police you appeal it to the Nevada Police Commission who reinvestigates the whole thing and makes a determination as to uh, the guilt or innocent of the officers San Jose will audit the actual case and what they'll do is they'll look at what internal affairs does and they give a checklist of to-do lists of things they want internal affairs to do um, as a result of their audit. So everybody has their own little um, model. Now, a lot of this came up after the Rodney King beating. I was in grad school and I noticed that there were over 500 requests of different governmental agencies uh, by cities and counties asking how to set up police review models. And I actually did my thesis on these different models and how they, they come together. The bottom line is policing is a subculture and it's going to be very hard to change how they've been doing business for a long time. Uh, police departments are actively involved in politics and they have um, money that they're able to give to politicians uh, to help them get elected and as the payback on that they don't want things to change which you know from the police officer standpoint I can understand that uh, but from the citizen standpoint you know, officers are now paid somewhere between eighty and a hundred thousand dollars a year, and for eighty to a hundred thousand dollars a year, they're expected to improve in their professionalism. And officers that don't do that uh, probably need to be looked at carefully and weeded out, and keep the ones that are doing a good job. The police unions ha uh, are are necessary, though. Um, we have groups like PORAC and the Legal Defense Fund. If you're a police officer and you're accused of wrongdoing, a lot of people will shun you. They walk immediately away from you. They turn their backs on you. And so you need to have organizations that will support you during that time uh, to help show your innocence on cases. You, you pay a little bit of money every month into PORAC Legal Defense Fund and it provides you with attorneys that specialize in defense of police officers. Unions also help shape uh, police disciplinary proceedings making sure they're fair because you could get some chief that is just you know uh, full of himself and he wants to discipline anybody and everybody and you need to be able to have controls on that person to make sure it's a fair process and they also share, shape the hiring and promotional um, proceedings one of the things that I found was many of the old, older officers are in charge so that uh, there's still a lot of minorities and women who are just beginning to get involved in the police unions. Uh, my experience in looking at that is, is still that the, you know the the majority is in charge of the union, not the minority. What can uh, unions do if they're not happy with work conditions? They can do work slowdowns. They can have blue flus. Uh, in the city of Berkeley, we had an incident where we had certain areas of the city where our radios didn't work, and we felt that it was um, a uh, you know it was dangerous for officers to work and the city government would not pay for new repeaters so what we did was we took an, an ad out very political in the paper and we showed the areas in the city with a, you know like a, a coloring like a gray dark gray a map of the city where the radios didn't work and let me tell you what within a week we had the hundred twenty thousand dollars to get the new radios and get things back to where they were working private policing one of the big moves now is a lot of uh, areas that used to have police officers especially doing walking beats in places like uh, uh, shopping centers are all going to private policing and uh, so there's a lot of growth and development private policing uh, is large in terms of personnel and resources in federal state and local law enforcement combined and uh, what you're seeing is they deal with a lot of the order maintenance things like you know uh, 
they have to have an emphasis on what the contractor person hiring them wants them to do. It's a whole different job. In reality, you're not out there doing general law enforcement. You're doing law enforcement, which is totally uh, controlled by what the person paying you wants. Example, telling people they can't walk barefoot in Disneyland. Um, there could be a fight in a bar across the street from the auto sales lot that you're working on, but your job is to stay with the auto sales lot. Sure, you can call in the fight, but you're not supposed to go over there and deal with it. So, there's a whole level of different services that are provided by private security officers. Some are just watchmen. You know, they sit there and they, they watch the person coming in. They take license plate numbers. Others are deputized and given uh, arrest authority like the San Francisco Police Specials. The, in San Francisco, in certain business districts, they have money that's paid for by the businesses to hire um, part-time police officers who are, are like security guards, but they go through the police academy. They're almost like police reserves, and they work these areas. Now, the police have been hired to work off-duty for years. I actually worked in Moonlighted for a bar in Berkeley when I was a young police officer, and it's estimated that 150,000 police officers moonlight for private security firms. Um, and in most cases, off-duty police retain their full authority and powers to arrest, stop, and frisk. In fact, the way it does work in California is if you're going to be working uh, for another firm, you have to be licensed by Department of Con uh, Consumer Affairs. And you don't have the same powers of arrest until you decide that it's a serious case and you're going to be acting as a police officer. And in that case, you invoke your power as, uh, uh, of, of arrest under the uh, penal code. Conflicts of interest. Police officers are banned from doing certain things. They can't be process servers, bill collectors, repo workers, or investigate for criminal defense attorneys, bail bonds persons, or employees at uh, gambling establishments. Except uh, there are some, some exceptions to that. Many of the cities that have new Indian casinos, they call upon the police to work overtime for big events like boxing matches or big dances or you know, promoted concerts, that sort of thing. So police departments can decide if officers can get, be given permission to work outside the department or they may deny them permission uh, because they feel that the job is degrading to the department or physically exhausting or, or dangerous. In the Berkeley Police Department where I worked, you had to put in for permission to work. You had to give a description of what your, your job responsibilities were. And if it was something where you're carrying a gun, you could bet the chief would not allow you to do it. Some departments control their uh, the working of officers off duty by what they call a department contract model, where officers for a captain. Different models use the officer contract model, lets officers contract independently with with permission. The union brokerage model, like San Jose PD uses, lets the union set the pay scale and working conditions for outside employment, and also provides uh, police officers with radio and and uh, police car. Private policing. Definitely has different goals in public law enforcement. Um, a lot of it has to do with loss prevention, saving money. So prosecution is not the first goal. And a lot of it has to deal with white crime or internal theft. Recruitment and training. Uh, some of the problems is that private police have not been trained as well as, as a public police. And there's relatively little training provided in most places. And fewer than half of the states in the United States have licensing requirements. Because it's low pay, most people do it as temporary work, and it's done by either the young or the retired with few formal qualifications. And what you find is that there are um, more of the regulations toward contractual private police, meaning like firms like Burns and Wells Fargo Security, then private agencies that work uh, for companies, what we call uh, proprietary um, security. So like the, the security for the Hilton or um, the security for um, JCPenney's, um, they're not licensed necessarily. In California, the Department of Security and Investigations is the, is the regulatory body that uh, approves training for officers, and there's different levels of certifications you can get. The first is the powers of arrest card, which allows you to work as a security officer. Next is the baton card, which allows you to carry a police baton for self-defense. Then firearms card, 
and uh, they inf investigate use of force with injury, shooting cases, unlicensed guards. Guards, we actually have at uh, Contra Costa College the online powers of arrest course. It's a fee-based course, and you can take this course and take the test and then go to a local police agency where you have they have to verify your identification right there at the police department via live scan fingerprinting and uh, from there you pay your fee and you get your card in the mail this has been a long lecture and you have a lot of key terms to look at so at this point you probably want to pause the movie and make sure that you write down these key terms so that you understand what's going to be in the testing section the end of this lecture.